I think there's really no better way to disseminate real evidence-based science than through AOA guidelines. That's, that dissemination and implementation is such a huge problem in medicine. And to have an expert group, expert multidisciplinary group, be able to come together, distill that evidence down to what we really feel makes the biggest difference, and then interpret that in a way that says, okay, this is what we think is the standard of care at this point. Guidelines at the AUA are dependent on evidence, and as you know, evidence keeps on changing. So the AUA guidelines have a process where every one to three years, every guideline gets an amendment. This is a brand new literature review from 2013 to 2023. All new content reviewing the most up-to-date literature on the diagnosis and management of overactive bladder. What's really new about this guideline is our focus. We are focusing on shared decision making. This puts the patient at the center of decisions. And the reason we did that is because overactive bladder is a preference-centered treatment. We've also included data on all genders. Previous iterations of the guideline only included literature on women, and so we've been much more inclusive. Another new addition to the guideline is grouping treatments by invasiveness. Things are grouped in terms of behavioral therapy, minimally invasive therapy, more invasive therapy, to be able to present it to patients in a more cohesive way, not implying that one is better than the other. It just allows you to present it more factually to patients. So there were a couple of changes in medical therapy therapy, so low-dose Tadalafil along with alpha blockers is now a reasonable management strategy. We used to say do not do that. Other changes, there was a change to um, removing transurethral microwave therapy and transurethral needle ablation statements from the guidelines. We now call those legacy technologies. These guidelines are, are addressing it's which, you know, which patients need treatment and when and how to incorporate molecular, molecular imaging like PSMA PET into this disease setting. They're really important, really common questions that come up in the clinic, and that's where this guideline is, is trying to speak to and I think provides really clear statements. I rely on guidelines heavily. They need to be pragmatic, they need to be useful. So I rely on them heavily, I share them with my patients, but I think also insurance companies and insurers use these guidelines to change what is covered for patients. I think it, these are integral to the care and coverage of all of our patients. So I think they, they are the cornerstone of management of urological conditions.